as Father Malachi would have said, the cockroaches are in charge of the citadel, all right? And they achieved that back in the early 1960s in what they call their enthronement of the prince within the walls of the Vatican at the Black Mass that happened at that time. The, this is Windswept House. It's, it's the natural outcome of Windswept House, and it's the natural progression in almost a generational sense, Joe. This goes back to the late 1950s. By the way, my name is Joe McLean. I host a radio program called A Catholic Take, where we look at the world through a Catholic lens. I'd love for you to hang out with us. If you like it, give it a thumbs up and let us know what you think in the comments below. Got Rob, Rob Morrow, Flying Tigers. Good morning to you, Rob. Can you hear me, Joe? I can hear you great. Thanks for, for, uh, for jumping on at the last second here. You texted no me. Worries. I was on the show and I couldn't respond. Cardinal... So, the, the, so it's kind of a crazy conversation that we were just having with Kyle Clement about mm -hmm. satanic ritual abuse within the church. You know, the the yeah. fact is that there, are, like he says, there's at least nine cardinals in Rome who are performing these satanic rituals all the time. And then there is, just to summarize the conversation, then there is another, a secondary layer of like assistants, like priests, who go out and groom these ladies and then pass them off to these cardinals for black masses. And then, you know, of course, you've got the whole uh, pimp and harem thing going down with uh, Father Marco Rupnik, but it really looks like that is also satanic ritual abuse, according to Mr. Carl Clement. And then, you know, based on your expert, you know, experience and friendship with Father um, Maliki Martin, like, what, what, how, what can you offer here? Like, this is, sure. is this not Windswept House? The, this is Windswept House. It's, it's the natural outcome of Windswept House, and it's the natural progression in almost a generational sense, Joe. Uh, it, it, this, is not, this is not the beginning. This goes back to the late 1950s and has kind of grown as a cancer in the church. Uh, it was established in the United States uh, pretty much at the instigation of, at the time, Monsignore uh, Joseph Bernadine, who mm -hmm. later became a bishop and Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago. And then from there, he established his network, reaching out through the United States and directly back to Rome. Wow. It is mind-boggling, isn't it, to think about it these is. characters being able to operate openly, or like you know, it's. I guess the, I guess I guess I'm the naive guy, right? I'm the I'm the naive noob in the room. <laughs> like I just assume the best of everybody, and then all of a sudden I learn the hard way. Like, oh wait, you're a Satanist. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> that's that's like not good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like exactly. Like, it just, exactly. It, I don't even. It's like I don't even know how to react to it sometimes. Are we talking about a movie here? I mean, like, like the, this is the plot of Indiana Jones for crying out loud. What are we talking about? And it's real. They actually do perform these black masses in the Vatican or in the in the in the catacomb pact and and all this other stuff. There are there are priests out there who are who are grooming their victims to prepare to pass them off as victims for a black mass. Like, why in the world, if we know where the cockroaches are, don't we go stomping? Because the cockroaches, as Father Malachi would have said, the cockroaches are in charge of the citadel. All right. And they achieved that back in the early 1960s with their, and what they call their enthronement of the prince within the walls of the Vatican at the Black Mass that happened at that time. Now, many people say that that Black Mass did not really occur, that it was a fictional invention to assist in the story narrative of the book Windswept House. Uh, however, there are priests, and I will privately tell you uh, offline their names, who, along with Father Malachi, actually on the 30-year anniversary of the Black Mass of Enthronement, performed a, uh, a dual transatlantic dual masses of reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary for mm. the desecration done 
in the Vatican on that day. Another interesting thing you, your listeners might want to know is that when ritualistic Satanists perform uh, the Black Mass, and I don't even like saying those words, um, it is a complete inversion of the Roman Mass, but here's an interesting tidbit. It's, an, it's a complete inversion, all right, of the traditional Latin Mass in its form prior to 1962. Oof. They will they will not do a black mass according to the Novus Ordo Mise of uh, Paul the Sixth. Now, and why is that? Why? Well, th- this is oddly ironic. They don't think it's valid. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> That's like a Babylon Bee. Have you seen the Babylon Bee segments with the devil? Yes, <laughs> I mean, yeah. yes but it's... But it, but it, it. That's so funny. <laughs> but oh, but wow. it's, 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 it's true. They, they will not do a ritualistic inversion of the Novus Ordo Mise. Oh. Because, they say, because they say... And it's, it's kind of a... a it's kind of like almost in an exorcism when a priest forces the entity to acknowledge that, you know, Jesus is God and that the Virgin Mary is all powerful over them. And that, you know, the Virgin Mary, when she speaks, all hell quakes. Yeah. It's an, it's an acknowledgement almost by, Almost by, well, it is an acknowledgement by the enemy that nope, we we go we go for the real Jack Daniels. Don't give us lemonade. Oof. You know, it's funny. You know, similarly, I didn't know that about the sixty-two missile. Actually, I, I got my mind. <laughs> I'm just laughing still about that. It's so funny to me. Uh, but for for years now, I've I've said in the Catholic Protestant debate, and I've said, well, you know, as far as I know, there are no black sermons. There's no, mm-hmm. you know, there's no mocking of a pastor's sermon. There's just the black mass. Why would the devil uh, attack the holy mass, but not attack, you know, the sermon if Protestantism was was legitimate? It seems like that could be, you know, sort of anecdotal evidence to suggest that it's not, it's just not valid. And <laughs> you're making the point about the 62 missile. Uh, somebody was asking a minute ago, was it JMJ? Somebody asked whether or not. Uh, the Black Mass is said in La- Eric JMJ. Good morning to you. It, it says, d- "Is the Black Mass said in Latin?" Rob, do you know? They do it in both. both. They do it in both. If if they have a priest who is proficient in speaking Latin, they will do it in Latin. Kevin, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out. He asked a good question. How can Cardinal Wilton Gregory just recently go on Face the Nation and praise Cardinal Bernadine as his mentor and creator of the seamless garment theory, given what what uh, Rob just said? I mean, think about that, Rob. Like, like what? how are we to think about the people associated with these known bad actors? Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, it's it feels like one could only cast out. I, I don't know how do you yeah, come to so other conclusions. Joe, well, here's here's something, and I believe they are words of our Lord from the scriptures. By their fruits ye shall know them. Yeah. And judge them by what they do, not what they say. If a cardinal or a bishop or a priest or someone higher says something holy and then turns around and does something like uh, forbid the Latin mass, the traditional Latin mass in a parish and, you know, uh, exiles the pastor to East nowhere if he's recalcitrant, then you know it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize whose side that prelate is on. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting that you were talking about Satanism before. And in the movie, uh, not the movie, the uh, the book uh, Possessed by, I believe, Thomas Allen, in which Malachi Martin wrote the foreword for the first edition. It was 
is about the true exorcism that inspired Peter Blatty to write The Exorcist. And in that, the boy, I believe, was either in a, his family was either Lutheran or Methodist. And they got their minister over after medical doctors said, there's nothing wrong with him. He's just acting up. Mm. And they had the Protestant, they had the Protestant ministers come over. And the ministers couldn't do anything. Then they then they brought in an Episcopalian priest with air quotes around that. Um, and the demon, the entity savagely mauled him. And at that point, the Episcopalian priest said, you have to go to the Catholics. They're the ones who know how to deal with this. Yeah, let that sink in. Which is a tacit admission of what? <laughs> the authenticity and legitimacy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, which is which is why they they will not ape the in the black mass. They will not do an inversion of the Anglican or Episcopalian uh, prayer service, which looks very much like yeah. the Novus Ordo. Rob, you're in the midst yes. of writing your book, your memoirs on uh, Father Martin. Can you give us any updates on that? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, it's uh, it's going slow but sure. Um, I may actually be going over to Ireland mm. uh, because there's the the town that Maliki came from, and it's it's a tiny little speck of a town, but I think it's important to get a feel for where he came from. And it's funny because I asked an Irishman, I said, I need to find out how to get to the town of Bally Longford. And he looks at me and he goes, do you mean Bally Longford? (laughs) 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 So I'm, I'm also, I'm also in the midst of a move out of central New Jersey, uh, up into the mountains of Pennsylvania, Northern Pennsylvania. Um, so that's occupying some of my time, but also uh, because most of your readers know that I was an officer in the CIA, the book, because, uh, and here's a little tidbit teaser. All right. Um, the book, because it touches on Father Martin's work behind the Iron Curtain for the Vatican during the reign of Pius the Twelfth. Ooh. And there are there are elements of confirmation of what he did behind the Iron Curtain and what happened to him behind the Iron Curtain that were corroborated by cable traffic from the CIA. The book has to be has to go in front of what's called the people can look this up online at the CIA.gov. Um, if you want, if you're a former officer and you mention the agency in any way, your entire book has to be reviewed by what's Ooh. called the Pre-Publication Classification Review Board, the PCRB. And when I'm done, I have to submit the book to them, and they take like two and a half months to clear it of anything that they think may reveal uh, classified sources and methods of intelligence collection. So... Okay, uh, you you just piqued my curiosity big time on that one. All right, because like, man, you're you're submitting your work to someone else, and if they make it, if they're having a bad day, having some indigestion, they eat a little too many carbs or whatever, they just just they get moody, and then they decide to start changing your work. Boy, that I'd take that personal personally. So, are you? Is there a within the within the community of ex you know uh, ex alumni? Is there like Mm -hmm. a, hey, let me just tell you, here are the guidelines that you should really just do this and don't do that. Say it this way and not that way. Is there anybody anybody who helps you? Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. I have have a mentor who was one of my former uh, bosses, a former station chief in the agency, who is also a devout Catholic. And uh, he said, you can touch on this. Don't use these words. Use these words. He says, your book will pretty much easily flow through, he said, because of two major elements. Number one, you're talking about events that happened uh, 67 years ago, number one. 
And number two, you're talking about events that happened in, well, what was an evil nation state, the Soviet Union, which officially no longer exists. There's still a ton of communists in Russia, a ton of true believers, actually. Mm. But the nation state of the Soviet Union as a Marxist-Leninist party state does not exist anymore. Even Maliki Martin admitted that. He said, wow. Marx, he said Marxism is alive and well. He said, but Leninist communism as a governing political system only exists in a few places like North Korea. And even then, it's more of a uh, family-related totalitarian dynasty. Did, uh, did Father Martin have an inclination of his, of his death? He did not have so much a premonition as he knew that it was a possibility. Mm. Because there's, there's a lot of people who think he was assassinated. And he was, he was not assassinated. All right, a lot of people say that, you know, uh, secret agents from this nation or that nation assassinated him. And the answer is a categorical no. All right. He was he was knocked down in his apartment. He struck his head on a hard surface. And when he did, he suffered what's called a cerebral hemorrhage that put him in the hospital and into a coma. I was there in the hospital in the critical care unit at Lenox Hill in New York while Father Maliki Martin was hooked up to all kinds of beeping machines in a coma, and I said the rosary for the repose of his soul mm. after he had received traditional pre-Vatican II extreme unction, viaticum, and the apostolic blessing was said to him by a traditionalist priest. What's the target for the book, Rob? How many pages are we talking about here? Uh, it's not going to be a tome, Joe. I would say it's probably going to be about 200, 250 pages. Really? Because it's, it's my memoirs of my interactions yeah. with him and what he told me. So, you know, we, we, had, we had adventures, some of which were exciting, some of which people would consider mundane. Yeah. For, for one example, one example. He was in contact with a family out in Pennsylvania that, praise be to God, I was able to reestablish contact with. And their local parish had just completely gone off the rails. I mean, it was clown masses on steroids. And they, they provided proof to Father Martin of this. And what Maliki did was he called me up and he asked me, and he would always say, he would always, when he did it, he would always say, tell me this. <laughs> he would always <laughs> preface it with that. Uh, and he said, would you be able to take me out to such and such a town in Pennsylvania to perform a traditional Latin mass at the home of a very devout family? And I remember we would walk in and you knew, you knew walking into their home, you were walking into a sanctified place. Mm. Maliki, Maliki would walk in, and he would get such a smile on his face. Mm. There were pictures of this. There was, a, there was a crucifix. There were statues and pictures of the saints, the Immaculate Heart, the Sacred Heart. They had set up, actually very interestingly, the, the, uh, the wife and mother had set up on their stand-up piano an altar, a traditional Roman Catholic altar. Mm. And Father Martin said the traditional Latin Mass for them and gave them the Blessed Sacrament, and I was his altar server. Oh, Edward Clancy's on the team, says the evil fruit of the, infl the infiltration that Bella Dodd spoke about. Yes, good yes. point, Edward, 100%. Uh, Bella Dodd, we had that great conversation with Dr. Paul King Gore a couple years ago now. I guess it's been a year and a half or whatever uh, about he the book he co-wrote on Bella Dodd, which is the penultimate in my opinion, uh, argument on what Bella Dodd did or didn't do or claimed or didn't claim. And looks like she, in fact, did assist in stacking uh, stacking the deck at seminaries. So I guess, is it any wonder then 
Rob, maybe you can speak to this. Is it any wonder then why we see like a the 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 College of Cardinals nine car- Cardinals at any given time in Rome, you know, practicing the dark arts and having their priest priest assistants, you know, grooming victims. But, I, but, it's I, but just, the, the flip side, though, is this must have been going on for far greater than Bella Dodd. It's it's generational, Joe. The same way that Satanism can be generational in a family, it's handed down to uh, from senior cleric to lower level clerics to their acolytes who perpetuate it. So it's not surprising at all that it is continuing to a great degree. Because yeah. Malachi, in his book, The Keys of This Blood, he referred to uh, Pope John Paul II acknowledging that there was something in the Vatican, a malign force that was known to uh, believing Roman Catholic clerics as they just referred to it as the super force. The super and force. it was um, the super force and it was evil, wicked, and it frustrated through its acolytes in Rome and in the Vatican. It frustrated many efforts of Pope John Paul II. When he did the alleged consecration in 1984, all right, a certain cardinal approached him at the last minute and warned him that if you mention Russia in your consecration in front of the first statue of the Virgin today, it will be the equivalent of declaring war on the Soviets, which is an echo of something that was said to John the 23rd years earlier. And that's why he said in his alleged consecration, he said, and we also entrust to your immaculate heart those people who still await our consecration. That's not a consecration. That's a... Maybe we'll do it someday, but hang in there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> this is a great idea. Somebody should do it someday in, in the future. You know what? That that kind of reminds me of the modern uh, the modern blessing for holy water in the Book of Blessings, which is uh, God, please bless those who use this holy water. Yeah, which is not a blessing yeah. of the water itself, <laughs> right? <laughs> why are we exactly? Doing this? Yeah, like it doesn't it doesn't mean well, it. You know, it's still, Joe... you know, there's. And you're 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 blessed if you use it. Yeah, that's nice. But it's not it's not exercising the salt and then putting the salt in the water. Like, and exercising did we need the water to change and... that? Like, who, who <laughs> what dicastery at the Vatican was like? You know what we need? We need to change that blessing of the water. I've, that's I've, I've, okay. Get the committee together. Let's have some meetings. I've like, known I've known I've known some priests. You know, good good solid. You know, uh, diocesan Novus Ordo priests who say, yeah, when when I can, I try to use the old ritual because. The Book of yeah. Blessings basically doesn't have any blessings in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joe, I'll, ahead, tell you so- I'll tell you, Joe, I'll tell you something else. It is that the Vatican officially approved um, bishops to let priests use the old rite of exorcism instead of the new rite of exorcism that came out a couple of decades ago. Yeah. Uh, the specific reason is that the uh, the prayers— are what are known as, uh, there's two types of prayers, imprecatory and deprecatory, mm. all right? And one of, the, one of them, in one of those sets of prayers, the priest in persona Christe is using the power of Jesus to command the wicked spirit to leave the afflicted person. And in the newer rite, He's not doing that. What he's doing is he's saying, dear Lord Jesus, please deliver this person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see the difference there? Yeah. Big, He's 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 not acting with the power of our blessed Lord. Yeah. He's just saying, Lord, please help him. We really feel bad. I mean, I'm <laughs> paraphrasing. Yeah. It, it, doesn't, Damon, it doesn't mean it doesn't have to work. I know, you know, we have testimony from 
yeah, exorcists sure. and stuff that that can still work, and and that can happen even with just someone praying for someone who is possessed. It depends on the on the Lord's yeah, Gabriel, grace, but it's different. Father Gabriel Amor, God rest his soul, even he talked about mm-hmm. you know the differences between the old and the new, and how he would sometimes use the old and sometimes use the new. It just he'd go back and forth, but yeah. But either way, Damon makes a good point. Says Malachi that's why we. Him. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Damon says that's why we need a return to tradition. Words have meanings and are powerful. Mm. And in the uh, in the in the spiritual combat, and spe- specifically the fallen angels, it's a legalistic world. They do what they are allowed to do legally. They they, they right. operate on a legal code, a very strict legal code. So words have meanings, and you got to be careful about the words you're choosing to use and the actions you're choosing to do because you know they have there's consequences here. So if you if you if you take, you know, what was before formulaic, but at the same time specific, and then you water it down to who knows what, well, you're leaving me a loophole. I mean, they're attorneys. These these fallen angels are attorneys, uh, practically. You know, if the glove yeah. don't fit, you must acquit. Well, th- that's their new mantra for crying out loud. What was uh, – you mentioned a minute ago that he was – that he knew Father Amorth. What was his opinion of Father Amorth? Do you know? He thought he was a very brave priest, kind of in a in a a David and Goliath situation. At the time, he told me Father Amorth was working with, and this is back in the early 1990s, um, at least a dozen exorcists in Rome and the Vatican, and they had more work than they could handle. Yeah, yeah. I think when I read, I have a book, I have a couple of books on Father Morth, but I can't remember the title of the one I'm thinking about now, but just was his own words, like, you know, and he was talking about how, I, I think here in America, at least, we think of the occult as like somewhere else. Like it's like, we're, it's, it happens, we know it happens, but it's kind of out there. Whereas Father Morth would talk about the occult, you know, uh, palm reading and all of that kind of nonsense, going to going to witches and wizards and whatever to get spells and hexes done and and what all this like that was a part of the Italian culture and it was happening like all the time in all up and down the peninsula. So that was attributing to why he was just overwhelmed and so busy. Would you say that's fair? Yes. Yes. And it's, it's analogous, for example, to what happens in Central and South America with the satanic cult of uh, that's known as Santa Muerte. Yeah, Santa. Ex- yes. Yeah, exactly. So it's analogous to that. And it, al- it also exists in the United States and Canada. And as uh, Father Martin said, uh, it is prevalent and thrives among people who, in their normal daily lives, as doctors and lawyers and architects and yeah. business owners and politicians uh, who during the day maintain perfect probity and correctness within their lives, but they actually belong to satanic covens. Today with Kyle Clement, we're having this conversation with Kyle Clement today, or we're having a conversation with you with Father Malachi Morton or, or Rachel, uh, Rachel Ma- uh, Master, uh, Master Giacomo. Y- Master Jacob, thank you. When we have these stories, we talk about these stories, they're they're real. It's not some conspiracy theory thing. It's not some crazy thing that happens out there only in the shadows and in seedy parts of town, but it's happening, you know, all over and it's happening in your neighbors. And when you play with fire, you get burned. And I don't think it should be any mistake to say we're seeing the uptick in that, right? Like we're like whenever I ask exactly. exorcists. Whenever I ask exorcists, hey, how's the workload? They're like, well, it's getting worse. Like, we should be paying I'll tell you the attention to why, that. Joe. Joe, I'll tell you the reason why. It is because Maliki specifically told me that as, uh, and it, it's tied into Fatima and Pope Leo the Thirteenth and his vision and the St. Michael prayer, that in our time, God has permitted and I don't even want to say what they are. Everyone will know what they are, but when I say the words, God has permitted entities from the realm that is ruled by the adversary to now be released upon the earth, who in the entire history of mankind up until now have been chained in hell. 
Mm. They are now unleashed among us. If you want to know, for example, you mentioned before the movie with, uh, I believe, Russell Crowe about Father yeah. North. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Malachi would have said that was akin to The Exorcist. It was a right. Frankenstein, Dracula, Saturday afternoon matinee thriller to scare the teenagers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, if, Russell Crowe, come now, want, man. Now, if you want to know what comes, if, if you want to use a scale of 1 to 100, that was maybe a 19. All right. However, if you want to know what actual demonic possession, not exorcism, but possession looks like, watch the movie um, that came out after it. And I'm trying to um, remember the title right now, but it was about a man in prison. Oh, yes. Nefarious. Nefarious. Watch Nefarious. Because I watched yeah. Nefarious, and I got chills because I it it just brought back memories that I'd rather not dredge up. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. I I I liked Nefarious. I went to the red carpet premiere of Nefarious. I thought it was. Uh, it's obviously not like you know the greatest film ever made, but I, I had a lot of redeeming qualities in my opinion. And one of the things that I really appreciated about Nefarious was it did not go over the top Hollywood on us, on the spinning heads, levitating off the floor, that projectile vomiting exactly. thing. It, it, it really was way more subtle and nuanced. And I think, and I would argue even more powerful as a result to that, that, you know, that choice. So it was very good. Very, very good. I would, um, I, I would also, I would also say, Joe, that, you know, the scene in Nefarious where the conciliar priest walks in with his sweater. Yes. And at, yeah. and at, and at first, <laughs> at first, yes. the demon was terrified until the priest began yeah. his soft soap. Yes. That you was know, such a great let, scene. Let's all be, let's all be. <laughs> and then all of a sudden the demon realizes, oh, this priest doesn't really have faith. Yeah. Yeah, so we're on the same team now, he says. I didn't know we exactly. were working together. <laughs> that was so, so good. Like, fa uh, father, uh, father modernist of the Jesuitical Society. Well, we just re-released the movie Hostage to the Devil. It was taken up by a new producer. So look for it online. It will be available for the next six years, I believe. Wow. All right. Where, where online? Uh, I will send you that information once I reach out to uh, Causeway Films in uh, Britain. Okay. I'm losing power, so I think I'm going to sign off and just uh, and say goodbye because I can hear the thunder booming above my head and lights are flashing. So uh, probably a, a, a good opportunity to say goodbye. Rob, thanks for jumping on the after show. Great convo. Oh, happy to help, Joe. Always happy Pr to visit. Praise be to God. Hey, do us a favor, everybody, and, uh, you know, uh, we're trying to do, like, a whole series here on this satanic ritual abuse, so share this information with your friends and your family and your social feeds. We'd be very grateful to you. Did you like that video? It's okay. You can admit it. It's perfectly fine. Hey, we cover the big stories of our day, from inside the church to outside the church to all points in between, and we do it from a Catholic perspective. It's called a Catholic Take. It's a radio program Monday through Friday. We live stream it right here on this channel, by the way, so make sure to subscribe, like, and share. We would be very grateful to you. And don't forget, you're going to want to watch this video right here because you don't want to miss anything.